amazing gathering. We're here in Park City. So we're, we're a little late starting, so I'm going to instantly bring up our amazing panelists. Let's start with Naja Lockwood. <laughs> Minette, you can sit at the end there. Minette Louis and Mina Yang Bonjovi. So these women I specifically selected because we want to do something around women. And whether you realize it or not, these women have really made Sundance. Between them, they have over a dozen movies. I call them the goddesses of Sundance because they know the ins and outs of Sundance. For those of you who want to have a closer relationship with Sundance, they know how to do it. They were there from the beginning. They've had so many films represented here. So let's just start. Naja, you tell us about your relationship with Sundance. I think it started as I was an arts commissioner sworn in by Mayor Willie Brown, as well as Gavin Newsom, who is now our current governor in San Francisco. And so when I moved here seven years ago, Sundance asked me to be on the local board of Sundance. And it's been an amazing experience learning about Sundance, about independent film, and, um, and uh, being really active, especially with impact investments and impact uh, films, which is probably the premier film fund for uh, diversity uh, in terms of um, inclusion and also for um, uh, documentary films. So, and currently you are? And social justice. Right, and currently what is your relationship with Sundance? You have a, a very large role here. Um, so, various um, ways. We are supporting Sundance with the initiative for our family foundation for um, Asian American filmmakers, especially coming to the labs. Uh, I'm also here under the governor for Utah Film Commission to support films coming into uh, and being filmed in Utah. We're so proud to have you here. You've been such an amazing force. So Minette, you are next. You have eight films over the years that have been My eight Sundance? film that's on this Instagram. This is the eight, eight film this year, right? Tomorrow. Eight films. How many people even make eight films? <laughs> All of them have been at Sundance, including this year's film. Tell us a little bit about your journey in Sundance. Sure. So my very first film uh, at Sundance was in 2009. It was a film called Children of Invention, um, an Asian-American film. Thank you. Um, Writer-director Zee Chun, who's gone on to write for Gotham, and he's now a showrunner for Gremlins, the new series that's um, a spin-off of Gremlins based on the old Chinese dude from Gremlins. Um, <laughs> and I also, uh, another film, Sundance film, I executive produced was a film called Love Song by So Young Kim, who's found a lot of success in TV recently. Um, Karn Kusama had The Invitation, which did not get into Sundance, but the Sundance programs regretted not taking it. <laughs> um, but Karin obviously is an amazing director. Um, I'm just thinking about my Asian films. And the film I have tomorrow um, that's premiering is a Mexican film called I Carry You With Me um, by Heidi Ewing, who's a documentary filmmaker turned uh, narrative director. So um, yeah, Sundance is basically made my career. So I try to premiere all my movies here if, if I can get in. Nina. Nina. Uh, also a veteran, five films over the years? Yeah. Tell us about films. your journey. Um, yeah, it really solidified my producing career is being here at Sundance. Uh, my first feature here that I produce is called Fruitville Station. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that was 2013. And then we came back with two films in 2015 called Dope. Um, at, thank you. As well as Chloe Zhao's feature uh, directorial debut called Songs My Brothers Taught Me. And then I came back 2017 with Roxanne Roxanne, yeah. the real life story about Roxanne Shantae. And then the last film I was here is Boots Riley's debut of Sorry to Bother You. Love this audience. Love the whole Sunday spirit. <laughs> so there's a lot of mythology about Sundance and getting in, you know, it's become just the, 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 the big prize, right? Let's demystify it a little bit for the audience, because I'm sure many of you would like to have Sundance films, or already have, or just currently have, but tell us about the first time that you got a film into Sundance, and what was like, what were you doing, and how, and what was your reaction, and then what have you learned since then about the whole process? Nina, you can start. 
So my first film was Fruitvale Station, and we came in under the radar, so I didn't know what to expect. I kept hearing about other films that had a lot of press and hype around it, and, and we were just so in the process of finishing up the film, going in thinking that, well, we made this little film, hopefully it'll do something. And, and um, the big wake-up call was the premiere where you had you know, the entire audience sobbing. And then me looking to the left and seeing agents and lawyers run out of the door. <laughs> so, and I'm like, why are they running out? <laughs> so that was my first experience, like, this is a business. And, and that's when I really realized that, you know, having a bidding situation that goes from midnight till six in the morning, going back to the house to take a nap, come back to continue negotiating, meeting with every home, distributor that wants your film it's a it's almost like a it's a science to it because you also have to decipher who's lying who really loves your film how much are they willing to pay for it because they can say they love it so much but give you really small offers that means they don't value it as much and throughout the years what i learned is any film starring people of color or or directed by people of color starring people of color is valued less. So that's the challenge that I've learned from 2013 to 2018, that the fight never stops. So. And at that point, how many films had you already produced? Fruitvale Station was your which number film? Like, had you Oh my gosh, I did films? a lot of um, crappy films prior to that. <laughs> um, but I always tell producers, I go, never be ashamed of the projects that you worked on because that's where you cut your teeth. You know, and people might be embarrassed to talk about it, but my first film that I was a producer on was called China Strike Force. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> Once in a while, it's on cable, and I'm like mortified. <laughs> so it was, it came as a big surprise that Fruitville Station was admitted, or, you know, what was your reaction at the time? I didn't know what to expect. It was more like, um, it was admitted it's in competition. I didn't know what competition meant. Then I found out when you're in competition, there's only 16 films that are chosen out of you know 10,000. And then it becomes this big thing. Um, and there's so much press you have to do. But there's so much strategy with PR. You have to f figure out who's going to represent your film when it comes to public relations. You have to make sure your sales team is on point with the message you want. Um, there's so much strategy involved and involves the director and the producers and you're in there really thinking through and luckily for me um, Forrest Whitaker is my producing partner so he was in the room and he would tell me he's like don't trust those people <laughs> you know because he's so experienced and it was so nice to have that even the sales agents would say it's so great to have ghost dog in the room you know and and it's <laughs> and it's but I learned so much from that process where cut to 2018 I can teach my filmmaker like listen this is how it goes and this is what they mean when they say this it really means this you know so it's a it's a problem. Uh, it's a process of evolution, of learning, and I always say we need to have more producers of color to be able to teach the filmmakers how to decipher the message. And you came with a sales team already in place, or did you yes. find your sales team? Yeah, we came, we came with a sales team already, because usually um, when you're applying, the agency somehow all know like they, what's percolating. So they'll start swarming around your film and say, can we see your film? We want to represent it. And what's a bummer is there are times where, you know, I've helped filmmakers where they would see the film and they're like, sorry, we're not going to rep it. It happened to me on Chloe's film. Okay, we'll get to maybe some of those stories later. Minette, you have also had many Sundance experiences. Yeah. So what was it like for the first one? And, you know, how were your eyes opened up? Children of Invention, I, it was just, I mean, that, we made that movie for $150,000, and it premiered in 2009, and shortly after the Lehman Brothers crash of 2008. So literally, like, every distributor that could have bought our film was dead. Um, and, and we actually decided very shortly after Sundance to self-distribute and made back all of our money for our investors. And we sold DVDs out of our backpacks and used the festival circuit, you know, as a theatrical run, because, you know, nobody was buying movies, and, like, 
let's face it, all the distributors are white and have no idea how to market a, an Asian American movie. So my Z and I were just like basically like figuring out how to market the film on our own, which is great because we learned all about distribution. But that entire year, uh, we didn't make any other movies because we were so focused on distributing our own movie. Um, but since then, I've learned that, you know, I mean, you know, you hear Sundance, Sundance is very much like college, and you hear like college admissions officers saying like, we can fill three classes, you know? And it's the same with Sundance, you can fill three classes of movies because there's just so much good stuff out there, and so, but, but they want to make a well-rounded class, right? So even if a movie's really good, they might reject it because they're looking for you know, certain demographics or whatever subject matter to fill those slots. And what I've learned over the years is that, you know, two things that Sundance really looks for are things, good movies, but movies that are also urgent, like the subject matter is urgent. So like I had, you know, two years ago, I had a film called The Tale premiere here, which was right after the whole Me Too movement kicked off and um, the timing could not be better for that movie. Um, and so that was an urgent movie, um, obviously. And then this movie that I have here, I Carry You With Me, is about undocumented immigrants, which is also a really hot button issue. Um, I think that the urgent issues, the timely issues really helps with Sundance. Um, I also feel like films that are a little bit different, um, that are a little bit weird, bolder, whatever, what have you. I had a film in 2014 called Land Ho premiere in the next section, which at the time was only a couple years old. And you know, that it was a, there was a bidding war on that and we sold and it, it, was, it was about two old white dudes who you know, travel to Iceland and have adventures. Um, really fun movie. But I think that, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, films that are a little bit off kilter and you know, it's so hard to get people out of the house and get butts into seats in theaters that like, you know, films have to be different. They have to be bold. Um, it, they can't be cookie cutter anymore because people have Netflix and Hulu and they could just sit in their ass and watch movies all day. Um, so it, they have to be a little bit different and, and original to get people out of their seats. So that's what I would say is like, you know, you can make a great movie, but if there's no sort of like hook to it, it's just, it's just hard to, to um, rise in the marketplace in, in terms of getting people's attention, so. So really good points. Naja, you've been like connective tissue for a lot of different films at Sundance, even ones that you may have credits on and ones that you may not. Tell us about the strategy of Game Changer and Impact Partners and why you seem to be very focused on Sundance, if you are, you know, and what, what are you learning and how are you changing with the times? Sure, so we just launched Game Changer Films and uh, I think a lot of my colleagues are here. So I'm one of the co-founders of Game Changer Films, and, in, uh, and I think Brenda Robinson, as well as Wendy Edinger and Geraldine Dreyfus, along with our new CEO, Effie Brown. Uh, we are a new team, but moving forward from also Manette's leadership of Game Changer previous to this, uh, to, to this fund. Game Changer Films provides equity financing for narrative features and development money, as well as strategic partnership for people with disabilities, the LGBTQ, women, and people of color. And this includes men from underrepresented communities. I think also what makes us different is that the diversity of our content is as diverse as our investor pool and our leadership making sure that Game Changer is both headed by and has significant financing from women and people of color. Also joining Game Changer Board of Advisor is our trailblazing producer, Nina Yang Bon Jovi. See, it's all very incestuous. <laughs> There's no accident that these three women are here together. And I think personally, I have been a great admirer of Nina and her work. Uh, so we are delighted to have Nina on board, to have her expertise, and also the support in terms of diversity and inclusion in her choices of film. So we're really excited that we are launching Game Changer Films, and we're really excited that we'll hopefully be working with each other yeah. to make something meaningful and to really further diversity and inclusion. Just, if I may, to reduce confusion, marketplace confusion. I did run Game Changer Films for a number of years. We financed 10 feature films directed by women. We garnered nine Independent Spirit nominations, Emmy nominations, Golden Globe nominations, and we returned a profit for our investors. However, 
I am a producer at heart, and so you know, I, I love being a financier, I love being an executive producer, but I was like missing working with the directors. And so, you know, Naja came in, Brenda Robinson came in and pivoted the game changer structure so to include, you know, and Effie is running it, which is great. Effie and I are great friends. But um, but yeah, so that's that's the thing. I'm I'm back to producing and I have my own company now, the population. Um, new company. Oh, sure. Yes. Tell yes. us about One your of my new company. Partners, Derek Wynn is here, who yes. was with me at Game Changer. Um, Molly Asher, who produced The Rider, is also part of our company. Mary Jane Skalski, who was with us at Game Changer, is also an advisor for, with, with our company. But we're, we're more of a production company than a financing company, um, where, whereas Game Changer is primarily focused on like financing. Um, it was the production and the creative and the working with. Um, filmmakers that I've missed the most. So I actually just flew from set yesterday to come here to Sundance yesterday. So I'm like a little loopy right now. But you know that's the <laughs> that's that's the part that's the part that I miss is really just working with directors in the trenches. Well, just to not to to uh, talk about with them, not to confuse the marketplace. <laughs> okay, um, I am an advisor on Game Changers board. Um, I just love the fact that Brenda came in and Naja, and it really meant a lot to me because to see women of color represented on the investor side is really important. And and Effie is all, Effie Brown is also a dear friend of mine, and I really want to support her to make sure that they keep doing what they're doing. Um, I'm still the producing partner at Significant Productions with Forrest Whitaker. We we. We're the creative engine of um, discovering IP, developing IP, and then I have a fund, um, a film fund number two with my partners, who are many of them here. There's um, there's six Asian American business leaders that's alongside with me to support what we're doing. So it's pretty in, pretty incredible. So if there's any one piece of advice that you would give to filmmakers here about navigating Sundance, what might it be? When you say navigating Sundance, either, are you saying if e they Either have a, in terms of yeah. getting your film here, but perhaps more importantly, if they get their film in Sundance, and if there's, you know, what, what can you say about how to make the most of the experience? From, from my point of view, I think, the number one thing is if you get your film in. I think to get your film premiered here, in no matter what section of, of programming is a huge feat um, to accomplish. To be here, to have the presence, to launch your visibility, your voice is extremely important. Um, one big advice is really understand the business and the market. There is, this is a business at the end of the day. And um, my biggest, piece of advice for filmmakers of color and producers of color is don't devalue your worth and your project's worth because you will get beaten down by the business and, and, the, and the distributors and tell you how much you're worth. It happened to me on Sorry to Bother You when they're like, your film's not worth anything. And, and I had all... It happened in the end. At the end, I said, I'm not selling. And, and because I was getting really low ball offers and the, the rumblings were like, well, you have stars, but they're stars of color. And I'm like, I have Army Hammer in it. He's white, <laughs> right? And, then, and, and they're just like, well, you know, so it's all kinds of excuse, but yet they still want to bid on it, but give you really low amounts of money. So, so I told the reps, the agents, I go, I'm not selling. I go, I'm going to talk to my investors, and we're not selling because we know our worth. And, and is that the end of the story? Or no, the, the sales agents all freaked out, and yeah. you can't do that, and, and I will get us a respectable deal. And that's how it works. Yeah, so you, but you can't but cave in. So many of my filmmaker friends, and we were texting each other. They were like caving in to really lowball deals. And when that happens, it affects all of us who work in this space. But in the end, you got a deal that you were satisfied. Yes. And, and I think I want to make sure it had a happy ending. Yes. And, and I think that is right. I love that. Great story. My advice to filmmakers who are just premiering their film, first film at Sundance, um, what, so when I, you know, when, I, when we, Z and I premiered Children of Invention here 11 years ago, we made it a point to like RSVP to every party and like <laughs> make sure to say hi to everyone and not be shy about it. We literally would like just tag team parts and be like, okay, let's go meet this person. Let's, we were very like, like 
we're like, this is our opportunity. And like, we just, there's like everybody here you can meet, you know, heads of acquisitions departments at parties. And so we, re we really utilize those social opportunities to like make sure that we open doors for ourselves. And it really was a game changer in terms of like our careers and being able to do the next thing. So that's what I would do, go to the party. Now I'm too freaking lazy and I don't go to parties at all because I'm old and tired. But like when you're young, just go to the parties and talk to everyone. Don't be shy. Just go up to people. You know, people are drunk. Just go up to them. They'll be happy to talk to you. And it's a great, it's a great, you know, place where there's like, you know, social. It's very social and like just utilize it. Utilize the the um, the access you have right now to decision makers. Now, do you have anything? Yes, um, I'm very proud of Sundance because Sundance is the premier film festival that focuses on emerging artists. And uh, I think we continue to do that, and we're very proud of that. And I think the key is, as, as you say, is getting into Sundance. And I think there's, um, and I think there's, there's a lot of hustling, as, as you both know. And I think also you just have to realize, too, that so much of it is also beyond your control, and so much of it is also when you're here at Sundance, how much Sundance supports you in so many ways. Four years ago, we co-financed a film called Icarus. And Icarus is a story about, and it's a documentary, about how Russia has been doping since the 70s, its athletes, some of them at the age of 10 years old. And we never imagined, and it premiered at Sundance, and we never imagined that that was probably, it is the highest grossing documentary uh, in terms of the bids that we got. Uh, it was bought by Netflix. We're really proud of the film. And because of Sundance, uh, we went on not only to premiere at Netflix, but also we made huge change in the sense that Russia was banned from the Olympics. Uh, and its athletes were asked to do m many more series of testing. Uh, and so I think the change and the power of storytelling is truly at Sundance. Fantastic. I want to open it up just for one or two questions. We're running out of time. I knew it was going to fly by. But are there any questions out there that we can address the panelists? If not, yes. As a producer, how many films are you working on at once? And how do you decide on what's the next film that you actually have decided to work on? Um, as I mentioned, I came from set. <laughs> I just started production on a feature in New Orleans on Monday. It was a mistake to do that feature and Sundance at the same time. But um, I have uh, three features in a series in development right now as well. And you know, I'm still delivering I Carry You With Me. So I don't know, probably like five to seven features at the same time in various stages of development, production, sales, delivery. I'm thinking I'm visualizing my whiteboard right now. Um, I, Forrest and I have um, six studio films set up, and they're in development. Um, in the actual development slate, some indie, some more studio-driven films, I have about 12. Um, in negotiation for rights, maybe five. Packaging, I say two. Um, Post-production, two. One in distribution realm, one, which is a documentary called um, A Kid from Coney Island. And then um, television, uh, about six to seven projects in television and development. Yeah. And Godfather of Harlem. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're, I have a whiteboard because <laughs> my friend bought it for me. <laughs> I should say the five to seven that I mentioned is stuff that I'm, I'm actively working on. I have another 12 that are like sort of in development slash turnaround slash like let's figure out how to repackage yeah. stuff. Yeah, you have to as producers to have all that because sometimes you think something's going and one element will fall out and then you have to pivot and you go this way and you go that way and you always have that many going on and political climate changes, the business changes and everything. Changes. Stars are not stars anymore, you know. Yeah, and projects <laughs> and development, all of a sudden there's another competing project that came out made a lot of noise that's too similar. Yeah. You have to abandon it. Do you want to answer that, Nasha? Because you, you, from a, a different perspective. Yeah, I'm coming from the finance uh, perspective. So we just launched in January of this year, and uh, I am sure Effie is looking at many, many opportunities in terms of um, films. But we just finished co-financing Passing, 
Uh, and uh, it, it's a story that follows two African-American women, each of whom can pass as white, and choose to live on opposite sides of the color line in 1928 Harlem. And this film is produced. Right. So Nina, uh, I very produced that film. <laughs> It is produced by Nina and Forrest Whitaker's significant production. So do you want to say a few words about yeah. that? Yeah, so, so Passing, um, I spent the last three, three and a half months in New York. Uh, we are, that's the one I was saying in post-production. It's about, it's a really famous novel by Nella Larson that was published in 1929 about colorism and light skin privilege. And it's about these two black women who could pass as whites and they choose to live on the different sides of the color lines. It's a Ruth Nega. Tessa Thompson, Andre Holland, Alexander Skarsgård. It's just like a phenomenal cast. And um, we're just so proud of it, but it's one of those films that no one made since 1929. <laughs> How awesome are these women? And, and really, you know, on the ride over, I, we were talking, Minette and I were discussing the very unglamorous role of producers. We tend to be behind the scenes. We like to uplift and you know highlight the talents of others. But there's so much that goes on that producers and financiers do that sometimes we don't get credit for. But I, that's why I was so happy to have all of you here. We've run out of time. I'm so sorry. We have to bring up a, a whole new crew of people. But thank you, thank Janet. Naja, thank Minette. you, Janet. Oh, and happy New Year. Happy Lunar yeah. New Year.